Hi, Aqua Roomers. It's time for chapter reading. Yesterday, we were reading about Pa going into the big woods to help Grandpa. Grandpa is tapping the maple trees to get the syrup, to get the sap. So he made the buckets and he made the troughs, put them in the tree, and as you can see, all of the sticky sap is being collected. Really hard work. So here we go. The sap, you know, is the blood of a tree. It comes up from the roots when warm weather begins in the spring, and it goes to the very tip of each branch and twig to make the leaves grow. Well, when the maple sap came to the hole in the tree, it ran out of the tree, down the little trough, and into the bucket. Oh, didn't it hurt the poor tree? Laura asked. No more than it hurts when you prick your finger and it bleeds, said Pa. Every day, Grandpa puts on his boots and his warm coat and his fur cap, and he goes out into the snowy woods and gathers the sap. With a barrel on a sled, he drives from tree to tree and empties the sap from the buckets into the barrel. Then he hauls it into a big iron kettle that hangs by a chain from a cross timber between the two trees. Oh, you have to see this big barrel. Wow, that is huge. And you see he's pouring the bucket, the bucket of sap into the barrel, every tree every bucket into that great big barrel. Yes. He empties the sap into the iron kettle. There's a big bonfire under the kettle and the sap boils and Grandpa watches it carefully. The fire must be hot enough to keep the sap boiling, but not hot enough to make it boil over. Every few minutes, the sap must be skimmed. Grandpa skims it with a big, long-handled wooden ladle that he made of basswood. When the sap gets too hot, Grandpa lifts ladlefuls of it high into the air and pours it back slowly. This cools the sap a little and keeps it from boiling too fast. When the sap has boiled down just enough, he fills the buckets with the syrup, and after that, he boils the sap until it grains when he cools it in the saucer. The instant the sap is graining, Grandpa jumps to the fire, rakes it all out from underneath the kettle, then as fast as he can, he ladles the thick syrup into the milk pans that are standing ready. In the pans, the syrup turns to cakes of hard brown maple sugar. So that's why it's called a sugar snow? Because Grandpa is making sugar? Laura asked. No, Pa said. It's called a sugar snow because a snow this time of year means that men can make more sugar. You see, this little cold spell and the snow will hold back the leafing of the trees and that makes a longer run of sap. When there's a long run of sap, it means that Grandpa can make enough maple sugar to last all the year for common every day. When he takes his furs to town, he will not need to trade for much store sugar. He will get only a little store sugar to have on the table when company comes. So there's Grandpa. Oh, look at that big brass pot hanging between the two trees. And now he's ladling it out and pouring them into all of the milk pans. Mm -hmm. Grandpa must be glad there's a sugar snow, Laura said. Yes, Pa said, he's very glad. He's going to sugar off again next Monday. And he says, we must all come. Pa's blue eyes twinkled. He'd been saving the best for last. And he said to Ma, Hey, Caroline, 
there'll be a dance. Ma smiled. She looked very happy, and she laid down her mending for a minute. Oh, Charles, she said. Then she went on with her mending, but she kept on smiling. She said, I'll wear my Delane. Ma's Delane dress was beautiful. It was dark green with a little pattern all over it that looked like ripe strawberries. A dressmaker had made it in the east, in the place where Ma came from when she married Pa and moved out west to the big woods in Wisconsin. Ma had been very fashionable before she married Pa, and a dressmaker had made her clothes. The Delane was kept wrapped in paper and laid away. Laura and Mary had never seen Ma wear it, but she had shown it to them once. She'd let them touch the beautiful dark red buttons that buttoned up the front, and she had shown them how neatly the whale bones were put in the seam sides with hundreds of little crisscross stitches. So sewn inside the dress were pieces of whale bone and the stitching crisscross, crisscross, crisscross to sew it in. It showed how important a dance was if Ma was going to wear the beautiful Delane. Laura and Mary were excited. They bounced up and down on Pa's knee and asked questions about the dance till at last he said, now, you girls run along to bed. You'll know all about the dance when you see it. I have to put a new string on my fiddle. There were sticky fingers and sweet mouths to be washed. There were prayers to be said. By the time Laura and Mary were snug in their trundle bed, Pa and the fiddle were both singing while he kept tied with his foot on the floor. I'm the Captain Jinx of the Horse Marines. I feed my horse and corn and beans. And I often go beyond my means. For I'm Captain Jinx of the Horse Marines. I'm Captain in the Army. <laughs> and now, ooh, dance at Grandpa's. Monday morning. Everybody got up early, in a hurry, to get started to Grandpa's. Pa wanted to be there to help with the work of gathering and boiling the sap. Ma would help Grandma and the ants make good things to eat for all the people who were coming to the dance. Breakfast was eaten, dishes washed, and beds were made by lamplight. Pa packed his fiddle carefully in its box and put it in the big sled that was already waiting at the gate. The air was cold and frosty, and the light was gray when Laura and Mary and Ma, with baby Carrie, were tucked in snug and warm under the robes on the straw in the bottom of the sled. The horses shook their heads and pranced, making the sleigh bells ring merrily. And away they went on the road through the big woods to Grandpa's. The snow was damp and smooth in the road, so the sled slipped quickly over it. And the big trees seemed to be hurrying by on either side. After a while, there was sunshine in the woods and the air sparkled. The long streaks of yellow light lay between the shadows of the tree trunks and the snow was colored faintly pink. All the shadows were thin and blue, and every little curve of snowdrifts and every little track in the snow had a shadow. Pa showed Laura the tracks of the wild creatures in the snow at the sides of the road. The small, leaping tracks of cottontail rabbits, the tiny tracks of field mice, and the feather stitching tracks of snowbirds. There were larger tracks like dogs tracks where foxes had run and there were the tracks of a deer that had bounded away into the woods. 
the air was growing warmer already, and Pa said that the snow wouldn't last long. It did not seem long until they were sweeping into the clearing at Grandpa's house, all the sleigh bells jingling. Grandma came to the door and stood there smiling, calling for them to come in. She said Grandpa and Uncle George were already at work out in the maple woods, so Pa went to help them, while Laura and Mary and Ma, with baby Carrie in her arms, went into Grandma's house and took off their wraps. Laura loved Grandma's house. It was much larger than their home. There was the great big room, and there was a little room that belonged to Uncle George, and there was another room for the aunts, Aunt Dosha and Aunt Ruby. And then there was the kitchen with a big cook stove. It was fun to run the whole length of the house from the large fireplace at one end all the way to Grandma's bed under the window at the other end. The floor was made of wide, thick slabs that Grandpa had hewed from the logs with his axe. The floor was smoothed all over and scrubbed clean and white, and the big bed under the window was soft with feathers. The day seemed very short while Laura and Mary played in the big room and Ma helped Grandma and the ants in the kitchen. The men had taken their dinners to the maple woods. Remember, dinner is really lunchtime. Mm -hmm. So they had taken their dinners into the maple woods. So for dinner, they did not set the table, but they ate cold venison sandwiches and drank milk. But for supper, Grandma made hasty pudding. She stood by the stove, sifting the yellow cornmeal from her fingers into a kettle of boiling salted water. She stirred the water all the time with a big wooden spoon and sifted in the meal until the kettle was full of a thick, yellow, bubbling mass. Then she set it on the back of the stove where it would cook slowly. It smelled good. The whole house smelled good with the sweet and spicy smells from the kitchen, the smell of the hickory logs burning with clear bright flames in the fireplace, and the smell of a clove apple beside Grandma's mending basket on the table. The sunshine came in through the sparkling window panes and everything was large and spacious and clean. After supper time, Pa and Grandpa came from the woods. Each had on his shoulders a wooden yoke that Grandpa had made. It was cut to fit around their necks in the back and hollow to fit over their shoulders. From each end hung a chain with a hook and on each hook hung a big wooden bucket full of hot maple syrup. So that is a yoke and it makes the heavy maple so much easier to carry. It takes the weight off. Mm -hmm. Pa and said Pa and Grandpa had brought the syrup from the big kettle in the woods. They steadied the buckets with their hands, but the weight hung from the yokes on their shoulders. Grandma made room for a huge brass kettle on the stove. Pa and Grandpa poured the syrup into the brass kettle, and it was so large that it held all the syrup from the four big buckets. And then Uncle George came with a smaller bucket of syrup, and everybody ate the hot, hasty pudding and maple syrup for supper. Uncle George was home from the army. And we're going to read about Uncle George tomorrow. So, it's exciting. I can't wait to find out what happens at the dance at Grandpa's. Great chapter. Thank you, Aqu Aqua Rumors. Until tomorrow. Bye.